Are you looking to understand how Mule's data weave map operator works? In this tutorial, I'm going to walk you through what the map operator does and how to use it. So you can incorporate it into your Mule flows for fast, effective data transformations. Let's start inside the MuleSoft document. If we navigate under Mule Runtime, Data Weave, there's a section named Operators, which will list out all the different operators that we could use inside Data Weave Transformers. The first one on the list is Map. I'm assuming they're listed by popularity. In my experience, the Map Operator is the one that I've used the most. The document describes the functionality as returning an array that is the result of applying a transformation function to each of the elements. We're going to break this down into parts. We're going to start with the second part of this expression to each of the elements. And for that, let's get into an example. I've loaded up my AnyPoint Studio and today we're using version 6.3.0 of the Studio and we'll be using Mule Runtime 3.9.0 Enterprise Edition. I've created a simple flow that only contains a transform message. AnyPoint Studios allows you to run tests against your transformation directly inside the components configurations. This makes testing so much easier. So let's just make this a little easier to see. Perfect. So what we've started here is a simple transformation. We'll be outputting application JSON. It'll just contain the users as a key and an array defined inline. We won't be using any input payload right now just to keep it simple. And if we click the preview panel, as you can see, it'll output a JSON object with a key users and then the value of our three names that we defined. So now let's add our map operator. I don't want to get ahead too quickly, so let's ignore what I wrote in the function and let's just observe what's in the output. We still have our user's key, but its value is an array defined by the square brackets that consists of multiple JSON objects. And inside each object, we have a number as well as a name. So let me switch out of this and let me describe what's happening. On the left side here, I've printed out the three names that were in our array. Remember the documentation saying that our map operator applies the transformation function to each of the elements. This means as we iterate through our list, we first look at the element John, which is that would be at index zero. Then we move on to the next element and we apply our transformation to Peter, found at index one. And then lastly, we move on to the last element, Matt, at index 2. This functionality may look similar to you. It is basically a for each loop, where we loop through each element of the list and assign the index and the element into variables that we can use in our function. So that's great. So now inside your function, you can access the index and element by using the variables index and element. However, that's not exactly the case. Instead of using a logical naming such as index and element, DataWeave actually uses a double dollar sign for the index and a single dollar sign to represent the element. So back in AnyPoint Studio, the function on the right side of the map operator makes a little bit more sense now. So we're using the key index and we're printing out what we said that data weave stores the index under using the double dollar sign variable. And we're printing out the element using the dollar sign variable. And as you can see in the preview, it's John when we're looking at the first element, Peter when we loop to the second element, and Map when we loop to the third. So that handles the map operation we're using an array as the input. Let's show how that works when we use a more realistic object as the input. I've created this simple XML to represent three user objects that we'll be using. Each user consists of a name, 
as well as their age. Again, we can test our transformation using this payload without having to create a whole end-to-end -end mule flow. We can do so by defining the metadata to describe our input payload. We'll call this our users type. Our file is in XML and it's an example and let's load it. And it automatically picks it up that it's a list of users in XML format and each user contains a name which is of type string and age which is of type integer. So let's select that. The magic is when we click inside this box and go to edit sample data, our payload is automatically loaded from our user's file. Now let's wire this sample payload into our transformation. We're now using all the objects underneath users to iterate through. From our preview panel, we can see that our output is JSON that has the key users and the value is an array of JSON objects. And what we've defined here is that the object consists of an index and a data elements. And there you see the index and data. And each one represents, as we showed earlier, an iteration through the user's XML. So first looking at this user's element, we printed out the index of zero, as well as all the information that was underneath it. And then on the second one, we moved over to Lucas, the same thing, it was at index one, and we printed out the name and the age. And then we went over to Stephanie for the third one. One gotcha that you need to double check is that if you cannot guarantee that all users sub elements will be of type user, such as let's say one of them is of type admin, then you need to be careful because this will also get pulled into the output. This is because you're using payload.users, so every element is getting pulled in underneath it. If you wanted only of type users to get pulled in, then what you need to do is add what they call a multi-selector. And what that means is just to collect all user object types underneath the users tag. And in the preview window, you can see that the output no longer has Adelin. And that is our transformation using the map operator, having the input as an object instead of an array. In the real world, we very rarely need this output format. So let's use something a little more realistic. Let's say we want to pull out the name and the age. Since we know that the element object is inside the variable single dollar sign, we can access it using the dot notation and then the age. And now the output is a list of JSON objects consisting of the name and age of each user. Coming from an object-oriented Java background, this syntax was initially confusing for me. This section to the right side of the map operator acted like it was a function being evoked many times. But where was the function name and how did these variables dollar sign and double dollar sign get initiated? This is where the MuSoft document helped me out. Remember our description of the map operator? Returns an array that is the result of applying a transformation function lambda. So they're calling this section a lambda. Let me show you how that will look if we extract this on its own into a Java lambda. A lambda function, also known as an anonymous function, is another way to express a fully declared function into a shorthand notation. If you think about how you declare a function in Java, it starts with a public and then a return type and then a function name and then your function and then your return statement. If you're just writing a function inline, a lot of that you won't need. The public you can remove because you're not instantiating a class. 
the function name you can remove because you're not calling it by a function name. If the compiler can determine what you're returning based on the information inside your function, then you won't need a return type or even a return statement. So when you remove all of that, what you get is what's left inside this lambda function. At the front, you have the input parameters, which we call double dollar sign and dollar sign, and then this arrow, which is just Java notation, and the return is just the execution of this code. So the variables double dollar sign and dollar sign are hard coded as the default by DataWeave. Since they define it for us, there's no need to duplicate that and define it inside of our map operator. As long as we know it exists, then we can use it implicitly inside of our function. So putting it all together, the map operator loops through each element inside our input, either array or object, and applies this function, which is a lambda, to each element. If we want to make sense of this through Java code, we can think of it as our lambda function being embedded inside larger logic. So essentially the map operator loops through our input array or list of elements, storing the index into the variable double dollar sign, the element we're currently looking at into the dollar sign, and then performing our lambda functionality, passing in the two arguments. And then we take that response from that function and we aggregate it into our response string. And then after we're done all the elements, we return it back, which becomes our output. And that, my friends, is the logic behind the data weave map operator. Hopefully this helped cleared up what is really taking place behind the scenes, as at first it's quite confusing with all the shorthand notation data weave uses. If you have any further questions, please leave it in a comment below. And if you found this helpful, please make sure you hit the like button and please subscribe for more videos on MuleSeph technology. Talk to you later and see you next time. Peace.